So we've discussed kind of our overall objectives here of practical sampling. We would like to use an impulse train that's not this ideal impulse train with infinite height and infinitely small width, but more of a practical pulse train to sample signals. So in this video, we'll actually work through and kind of outline the general theory of using a pulse train like this. And in the subsequent video, we'll work through a very specific example where we actually use real numbers and things like that to work through um, the actual details. So first, let's get through the general theory. We are going to work with a pulse train that looks something like this or something like this. Really, any type of pulsed and periodic signal. And in either case, we'll call this signal PT of T. So the subscript there, capital T, indicates that these are indeed periodic signals with a period of capital T. And like I said, it really doesn't matter what the structure of the waveform is, but it's some type of pulse thing that's on and then off for some amount of time. So here we have kind of a rectangular pulse. Here we kind of have an exponentially decaying pulse. Exactly what that is isn't too important, but it needs to be some type of pulsed periodic signal. How are we going to sample then? Well, we're going to sample with this pulse train in the exact same way. Given some continuous time signal x of t that I want to sample, we are going to multiply x of t by the pulse train. The result of that product now is just going to look a little bit different. For example, if I was using this exponentially decaying pulse train, the result of multiplying this blue x of t times this pulse train would result in something like this. So I'm still going to end up having sampled or discretized in time because I have removed much of the signal, right? There's all these sections where I've gotten rid of it and I've really localized the signal content to just this one spot in time here. It looks a little bit different than it did with the idealized pulse train, but I've still accomplished my goal. All right, so now let's get into a little bit of the math. We'll stop drawing cartoons and do a little bit of the math to show why this is going to work out and still allow us to recover the original x of t from this sampled waveform. Well, since pt of t is periodic, we know that we can write down a Fourier series for it, right? Any continuous time periodic signal has a Fourier series representation. For the Fourier series, there's lots of different versions of the Fourier series. There's the complex exponential Fourier series, there's the trigonometric Fourier series, there's the compact trigonometric Fourier series. No matter which version of the Fourier series you use, it's really just the same. It's just a matter of what the equation looks like in, in the representation. So here I'm going to go ahead and do the compact trigonometric Fourier series, which means that I should be able to write the periodic signal PT of T as some constant C0 plus an infinite sum of cosines with different amplitudes CN and different phases theta N. And as usual, each of the cosines is some multiple of the fundamental frequency omega s. So omega s is the radial frequency, fs is the linear frequency, and for this particular example, since we're talking about a periodic signal with period t, that means fs is 1 over t. So I can write out pt of t in this form, and if I wanted to, I could go compute c0, cn's, the theta n's, given some specific instance of the waveform I'm working with. And that's something we'll do in the next video. Right now we're going to keep it just general. So I can write PT of T like that. So what happens when I sample X of T by multiplying by this pulse train? Well, I'm going to call the sampled signal XS of T, which is what I sketched in that little cartoon on the previous chart. I'm going to call the sampled signal XS of T, and we form that by taking my original continuous time signal X of T and multiplying it by the pulse train. Well, since the pulse train has a Fourier series representation, I can replace PT of T with that Fourier series representation. And then if I want to go ahead and distribute X of T across these interior terms, that's pretty easy to do. I have C0 X of T plus, and then I brought the X of T inside each of the terms on this summation right here. So let's go ahead and take a look at this form. So this is my sampled signal right here. This is the signal that's been discretized in time. And if we look at this, we can see what some interesting things going on. First of all, the sampled signal actually contains right here a very pristine copy of my original continuous time signal. Right here is the original signal I dealt with, x of t, just scaled by a number c0. 
So my sampled signal still contains a copy of X of T sitting right here, and it's only been changed by a single scale factor. What about the rest of these terms? The rest of these terms are all what we call modulated terms. If you remember your Fourier theory, if I have a continuous time signal and I multiply it by a cosine in time, in the frequency domain, what does that do? That takes the spectrum of my original signal and shifts it up by n omega s and down by n omega s. So because of that, these terms right here have all been shifted in frequency by the amount n omega s. So that's what we call them modulated. They've been shifted up in frequency. So if I wanted to go back from this sampling process, remember the sampling process was multiplying by pt of t to result in this signal. If I wanted to recover this signal, the only thing I would need to do is I would need to get rid of these and then undo this scale factor. Well, getting rid of these would be pretty easy. These are high frequency terms and I could remove them with a low pass filter. So I can easily get back to where I started by simply low pass filtering with the appropriate gain to remove the high frequency terms and get rid of the scale factor. So essentially I need to have a one over C naught. So kind of in conclusion, X S of T is the sampled signal that we desire. It's been sampled in time, discretized in time. We can recover X of T by using some appropriate low pass filter. So what I call quote practical sampling will work out as long as my sampling interval still satisfies Nyquist. And we'll get into that in the next video. We'll actually work through an example with a specific number for FS, and we'll see what happens to these shifted versions that we need to remove to make sure aliasing doesn't occur. So that is it for now. This uh, video summarizes kind of the general theory and strategy of doing practical sampling using a impulse train that doesn't consist of ideal impulses, but more of these practical, rectangular, or exponentially decaying pulses to sample the signal.